one term. So why should you switch from one box that has probability one term to have money in into another box that also has probability one term? Does the probability change after you show that one term is not? Ah, because the probabilities change when we open the empty box. How does it change? Why does it change? So, for example, if the money is here, okay, uh, so what happens is, uh, say you pick this box and then uh, the host opened this box and uh, it is empty. The question is, should you choose, should you stay with X or should you switch to this one? Why, what's the reason to switch? Yes? Uh, so it has a 66% um, probability that um, what you choose is the wrong choice. Exactly. And the the other wrong choice. So by switching, you're guaranteed to get the right. Beautiful, perfect. So you see, Probability that money is any of these three boxes is exactly the same. But this means that the probability that money is in one of these two boxes is two thirds. And probability that money is here is one third. When you open one box and show that it is empty, the probability, initial probability that the money is in one of these Two boxes is still two thirds. What only happened was that these two thirds were now collapsed to the probability that money is here. Right? Because initially, the probability that money is here is one third, and with two thirds probability is here. After the box is open, probability that money is here is still two thirds. But if it is, but it cannot be here, so with probability two-thirds, the money is here. Right. So this is, it's, um, probability is really, really tricky uh, thing. And uh, uh, you will see, we will do a few examples, and some of them are really um, to drive you insane. So, three cards problem. There are three cards. One is red on both sides. One is blue on both sides, and one is red on one side and blue on the other side. Okay? You pick a card at random, and then choose the side of the, not of the card, but of the card, also at random, and look at it, and it turns out that it is red. What is the probability that the other side is also red? So you have three cards, right? And the sides are red, red, uh, blue, blue, was it red and blue? And uh, red, blue. So you pick a random, a random card, and you pick the side, and it turns that it is red. Now, because the side is red, it cannot be this card. So it's either this card or that card. So the probability should be 50-50. Is that true? No. Why it's not true? Exactly. So the event actually has uh, the following. You could have picked a red, red card one side. You could have picked a red, red the other side. And you could pick the red side of these. So actually, there are three possibilities, uh, not two, right? That you pick the first side of red, red, the second side of red, red, or the first side of red-blue, right? 
So there are twice as much probability that it will be red, red than red, blue, right? So red will be with the two thirds. Very good. So, oh, two paths. That's one of my favorite. Not that I like beer, but. <laughs> I drink beer only when I mark final exams. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 24 pack per 100 students. <laughs> OK. So now, here is uh, the problem. You go to, uh, say, either a bus or, say, a train station, and uh, the tracks are, of course, circular. Say this is a tram, right? It goes to one side and then goes back and so forth, right? And you come to the stop here every day at a random time. Huh? There are two bars. One is on this side, so that's a western bar, and this is Eastern bar, and beer costs as much in the first one as in the second one, okay? And you come daily uh, at random time, and at the end of a year, you calculate that you were four times as often in the Western bar than you were in the Eastern bar. And the trams go in perfect five minute intervals. How is this possible? So every five minutes in this direction, and every five minutes in that direction. And nevertheless, it's four times as likely that you will be picking the, this direction than that direction. How is that possible? Ideas? If you go at a random time each day, you, you come at random time each day. Are the pubs the same distance from the station? Uh, well, say they are. It doesn't really matter. The train, the, the train comes every five minutes this way and every five minutes that way. Yes. Brilliant, exactly. So it happens that one train comes at 6 p.m. and then 6.05, did they say five or five, five minutes, right? And then 6.10, that's the train in this direction. The other train comes at 6.01, 6 Oh, 06, uh, six, uh, uh, 11, and so forth. So now, in order to catch this train, you have to come within, between 6 and 6.01. But to catch the train in opposite direction, uh, you have four minute slots. <laughs> so there is a phase shift between them, right? Very good. You see, probability is really, really tricky. Okay, here is another interesting one. Any questions? Okay, here is a really pretty one. So you have a biased coin. And you don't know what's the probability of the head, but you know it's not one half. And somehow, you have to design a random 0, 1 generator with exactly 50-50 chance of the, each of the outcomes. How would you do that? <coughs> so you have a biased coin, and somehow you have to simulate possibly with several tosses of a biased coin, and you have to 
get uh, events that are precisely 50-50 chance. Yes? Do you know the level of bias? Like no. But even if you did say probability of uh, the head is 1 over pi, <laughs> How would you do it <coughs> by several tosses of the bias coin? How would you see? Yes? So could, I'm sorry. Uh, could you toss it twice and, for example, uh, heads, tails is one, uh, tails, heads is zero, and heads, heads, or tails, tails is just a retoss? Brilliant, exactly. So you see, you toss the coin in pairs, right? You toss it twice, if you get head-tail, that's your first event. If you get tail-head, that's your second event. If you get head-head or tail-tail, it's illegitimate, you repeat the experiment. Now, even though the probabilities of head and tail are different, probability of head and then tail is precisely the same as probability of tail and then head. Excellent. Okay, you guys are actually much smarter than what you look. <laughs> okay. Oh man, this is my favorite. And uh, you have, uh, I won't tell you the solution. Uh, you can go home and uh, rack your brain for hours, I think. I, this one is really tricky. So someone shows you two boxes and he tells you that in one of these boxes there are <coughs> twice as much money as uh, in the other one. But he doesn't tell you which one is which, right? So you have uh, two boxes. Okay, so you have two boxes. And you know that with equal probability, one box has, uh, whatever the amount is, one box has twice as much money than the other box. Okay. And you are uh, allowed to pick the bo a box. You pick the box and the host opens it and it turns out that it has, say, $5. Now the question is, should you, and you get now the choice, either you keep the five dollars or you forfeit five dollars but you get to, but you get the, whatever amount of money is in the second box. Should you stick with five dollars or should you switch? And this is how you reason and so let's see how you would reason about that. So this is how you reason. We are told that the money, which box contains twice the amount, is with equal probability, right? So. Let's find what is the expected outcome if you switch. So the expected amount of money, right, is then with probability one half, it would be uh, 2.5 dollars, plus with probability one half would be 10 dollars. So the expected value is uh, uh, 5 and uh, what is this? 6.25. So the expected gain, if you switch, is larger than the gain if you keep 5 bucks. So it looks like you should switch. But let's see. Let's have a reality check. Probability, I mean, what does it matter that there was $5 inside? In fact, assume 
that the, pro the amount that you saw is x, then the expected amount of money is one half times two uh, x plus one half times one half x. So this is x plus one quarter of x, which is bigger than x. So no matter how what you saw, looks like you should switch. But I mean, what you choose the box, you don't open it, and then you decide decide it's better to switch, right? What's the problem with this argument, whether you should switch or not? Or do you think any ideas? Yes. Um, I don't think you've accounted for risk. Uh, okay, so we can. Mm -hmm. And the second box is not guaranteed. Well, second box is also guaranteed, but either twice or half. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that there's an amount that you would choose to pay to play this mm -hmm. game, right? So depending on how much you want to pay. Yeah, well, the mantra of gambling is uh, <laughs> you should always choose your steps to maximize the expected utility, right? Because uh, if you are a gambler, you are probably a compulsive gambler and you will gamble a thousand times and then you will get approximately one thousand times the expected value. Yes? Is your expected value based on the assumption that you do switch? This is the expected value of switch and it turns out that it looks as if the expected value of the switch is more than the value that you get. So uh, to alleviate your worries, assume that you will play uh, this game thousand times. Uh, then whatever the risk, uh, the, the, this should converge to the expected value. But uh, I mean multiple of the expected value. But it looks like here, totally logical, regardless of what is in the box, you should switch. This makes no sense. Okay, so this problem is known to have driven people insane. <laughs> so I let you think about this. You <laughs> I'm very evil, I admit. Sorry? Uh, I sometimes feel like it must have been written by the same people. <laughs> Um, yes, so uh, it's uh, the whole trick is this, that if I tell you the solution, there will be no use. <laughs> Try to figure it out, and next week, I promise I'll tell you the solution. <laughs> Question every step. And I'll give you a phone number of a very good psychiatrist. <laughs> Yes. So is the amount of money completely irrelevant and so you shouldn't use it in the calculation? Actually, the amount of money is extremely relevant. <laughs> like when you open the box and see that whatever's in there, is that the irrelevant the, the relevant part is, so what did I tell you? I told you here are two boxes. One of them contains amount x and the other one contains amount 2x with equal probability which one is x, which one is 2x. But I didn't tell you what's the probability of x. So think a little bit, there is something fishy, so try to go step by step and to localize uh, the, where the problem is. And I'll tell you the solution. The solution is that you should always, al almost always switch, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> so think about this. I don't want to, it's really good to... Um, sorry? <laughs> What is, oh, is it? 
I'll tell you what, if it was Bitcoin, the problem would read like this. Uh, you have five bucks, sorry, seven bucks, nine bucks, 21 bucks. One bucks. Okay, so I don't want to uh, just it's good to, to think. So just think carefully what I said, how I formulated the problem, and think whether what I said fully makes sense. Or am I actually cheating on you all the time? OK, so given n elements, the pro order statistics is select the i-th smallest element. So you are given an array with n elements and assume for simplicity all the elements are distinct. Your task is to find the i-th uh, element according to size. So if i is uh, 1, that would be find the smallest. If i is n, that would be find the largest, right? And smallest, which would be the largest element. How would you solve this problem? So I give you an array and find, ask you find the fifth element according to size. You sort it. Sorry? I think I know this one. I think you do it recursively. I think what you do to start with is you choose an array element at random, and then you, you divide the array into two parts, one of which has all the, uh, all the ones which are smaller than the one you picked, mm -hmm. and they're having all those that are larger. And then Brilliant. So that's a randomized solution. Uh, is sorting costs you n log n. But what you propose, what's your name? Uh, Chris. What Chris proposes actually is linear time, expected time. So what Chris proposes is, uh, by the way, what does this sound like? Uh, pick a random element and then split the array into all those smaller, all those larger. This is, this is quick sort. But, sorry? Is he sort? Um, so the trick is this is one half of the quick sort, right? Because uh, if I'm looking, say, for the, exactly, for the height element, I pick my pivot, right? So. I pick my pivot. And uh, from the array, say, I pick anything, and then I split everything into one part, which is all elements uh, smaller or equal to the pivot P, and then also a part of all elements strictly larger than P. If P is, uh, sorry, if uh, number of elements here, say number on the left, is larger than p, larger than i. I'm looking to the, for the i element. If here there are more than i elements, can my solution be in this part? No. So you see, the trick is, unlike the quick sort, in where you have to operate on both halves, you have to sort both halves, here you will always operate in only one half. Right? So why does this, of course, if you are unlucky, this method can also uh, be, you can run in quadratic time, right? Because maybe you are so unlucky that you got only uh, uh, one element here 
and uh, n minus one elements uh, here, um, or maybe zero elements here, and only pivot can be drawn away. Yeah? So uh, the size can drop one by one, and each round costs you n because you have to reshuffle the elements, right? So it can run in quadratic time. But assume that you are lucky, right? If you are, when would you consider yourself lucky if the two halves were equal. approximately equal? So then how many steps would you make? Let's calculate. Okay, so first split, you have to move n elements. In the second round, you, if you are lucky, you will have to move n over too many elements. Then you will do n over four step and so forth. So sum of n plus n over two plus n over four is equal to n times one plus one half plus one quarter plus one eight and so forth, so, which is equal to n. So lo and behold, uh, if you are lucky, you will end up with the linear many steps. How likely is it that you will be reasonably lucky? What does it mean reasonably lucky? Well, we choose some arbitrary fraction, say, um, 1 to 10, and we say uh, that uh, you are reasonably lucky if uh, the number of elements, uh, if the split is not worse than, uh, say, 1 to 9. So you have, if you have k many elements here, you have at most uh, 9k elements uh, on the right, uh, right? Any number will do, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be 1 to 9. So the question is, uh, with this relaxed notion of uh, luck, right? What is the expected, let's compute the expected, expected run time of your algorithm. So, and let's be, so we do the following. You consider all the splittings, so you started with n, then you get n1, then you get n2, then you get n3, and uh, so for n uh, some index m, and these are all decreasing, right? Um, so let's try to calculate what is the expected time, right? Um, the question is, uh, how many splits are you likely to have the expected number of splittings before you hit a lucky partition. Let us see. So how many unlucky partitions on average will you have? What's the probability to have an unlucky partition? Well, the partition will be unlucky if you pick either the 10% of numbers on the left or uh, right one tenth on the left or one tenth of the right if you consider them sorted, right? So probability to be unlucky is uh, 2 over 10, right? So probability of unlucky partition is 2 over 10. What is then the expected number of unlucky partitions? Well, the expected number is of uh, partitions is equal 
probability that you have no unlucky partitions at all, at all is uh, so it will be uh, let's count the number of partitions altogether. So it is uh, uh, only one partition with probability 8 over 10, right? Because that's the probability that first partition will be lucky. Plus, two times, what's the probability that you have precisely two partitions? It means first time you were unlucky, so this is with probability 2 over 10, times the probability to be in the second round lucky is 8 over 10, <coughs> right? Plus, what's the probability to have three partitions? By the way, are you familiar with how we compute expectation? Expectation is the outcome times probability of the outcome sum over all possible outcomes, right? So this is the outcome, this is probability of the outcome. Outcome here is two partitions, this is the probability of to have two partitions and so forth. So here you have to be unlucky twice and lucky once plus, and so forth. So how do we compute this sum? We can pull out 8 over 10 and get uh, uh, 1 plus 2 times 2 over 10 plus 3 times uh, 2 over 10 squared plus, and so forth, uh, uh, n times uh, 2 over 10 to the power n minus 1 plus and so forth, uh, right? How do we sum up expression like this? This happens, this, as you will see, pops up in all sorts of randomized algorithms and there are at least three, three ways that I know of how to sum up this. What would you suggest? How do we handle this? Anyone that has an idea? You can write this as a triangular matrix. So this is how I will write this. So 1 plus 2 times 2 over 10 plus 3 times uh, 2 over 10 squared plus 4 times 2 over 10 cubed and so forth plus is equal to the following. 1 plus uh, 2 over 10 plus, um, plus 2 over 10 squared plus so forth then plus uh, 2 over 10 plus 2 over 10 squared plus and so forth plus here uh, I'll have 2 over 10 squared plus 2 over 10 cubed plus and so forth in the next round it will start here 2 over 10 cube plus, right, because if you now sum up this way, you have exactly two of these, you get three of these and so forth. And each of these is a simple geometric progression that you can sum. That's one way, but it's not.